first I'm going to talk about California's, you know, where, where, where it is that we get our moisture. So what it is is we live in, I, I live in this area here, which is very dry, but it's, it's also dry here. And um, well, what it is is all of the water that we use in the, the Los Angeles metropolitan area is coming from this much wetter area here or from the Colorado River system here and then brought down south. Uh, next slide. So most of the water, at least for, for, for farmers in the Central Valley, it comes from what's called the Delta. So the Delta is this region here, right around near San Francisco. And this entire area is actually below sea level. Next slide. So this is the elevation of different regions inside the Delta, and this is the pumping station in the north part of the Delta where they take water from here, goes in through uh, uh, tubes to here, and it's filled into this, which is higher in elevation, and sent downhill all the way to the bottom, and then pumped over the mountains. So one thing that's really interesting about this is this whole area is very far below sea level, and it is oxidizing very, very fast, and it's continuing to get lower and lower. So there's a very, very big risk of a catastrophic um, disaster happening. It's one of the most likely places in, in Americas to have a big disaster in the near future. Uh, next slide. So there was a 6.5 earthquake and 20 islands were flooded. Um, go back to the slide before. So what it is is if uh, all of these berms that are here were built in uh, 1900s and right after the, the San Francisco Great Earthquake, and they were all built by farmers out of sand. So they're not structurally sound at all, and they're not ready at all for an earthquake. And if there was an earthquake, what's gonna happen, if you go to the next slide, it's gonna break, and then this will lower in elevation because all the, the berms will, will lower, and then a huge amount of water will come out of the bay into the area and flood the entire region, go, go back to the other slide, uh, and cover this into a, an area which is about the same size as the San Francisco Bay. So Where this is, is something, at? huh? Where is it at that you're talking about to get flooded? Oh, this is, uh, this is Sacramento, and then this is Davis. Oh, not, not Davis, um, Stockton, Stockton, sorry. Okay, so this is a very big risk that people don't even realize that this is gonna happen, but if we have a, a 7.0 or uh, earthquake or larger in this area, all of Southern California will lose a very, well, the Los Angeles Basin, at least down here in San, San Diego, you guys don't really be that effective. But, uh, this would, a lot of water would be there, and this is where all the water is coming from. So uh, when they talk about the smelt, you know, getting confused and stuff, this is specifically what they're what they're talking about. Next slide. So right now the ecosystems, you know, not doing very well there, um, and uh, because there's discharge in the Sacramento River, uh, there's new species, um, all the large basses and um, and, and sports fish are actually all introduced. There's only one native bass to California, the Sacramento perch. And um, there's been a lot of diversions that are moving water around. Uh, next slide. So what, where, where I'm at, I'm in Kern County. So in Kern County, this is how much demand we have in Kern County for water. And one thing that, that we're doing that I think that all districts should be doing is we're putting water back into the soil. So when we have um, more water than we can use, this is kind of moving to the next step. Um, uh, oh, sorry, go, go, go back, I'm sorry. Um, we, we put water in, so if we have a flood event, I, I believe that you guys should contact your local water agencies and tell them that you want to use groundwater banking because it's, a, it's one of the only ways that you can resupply your water, uh, your groundwater, and it'll allow you to survive much bigger droughts for much longer time period. So I live, where I live is Bakersfield, and we don't get, we, 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 we on average get five inches of rain a year. And this is showing how much water we've had going into the system every year. <coughs> but we're able to keep our supply, our demand is, is, is peak, and we're able to, to meet with it. Next slide. So these are, um, this is Kern County where I have my farm. And this is showing all the different sources of water inside of Kern County. So one of them is the Kern River. This is the California Aqueduct, or I guess that's the Kern Frank Canal. I should go in order of the things that it talks about. Okay, California Aqueduct. So the California Aqueduct, this is the ones I showed earlier. This is coming out of the, the Sacramento Delta. This continues on down all the way to San Francisco. 
Then over here, this is the Kern Frank Canal. This is my source of water because I live in what's called the Arvid Edison Water District. And then there's other people that supply the Kern River. And um, next slide. And this is our groundwater basin. Next slide. Okay. So this is showing all the, the banking areas and the districts where they have it. So all of these districts are using water banking. What's the source of the water for the water banking? Flood years. So whenever we have an access of water, we put it into the ground, and we're able to take 80% of the water we put in back out. Next slide. So this is my individual district. District. My farm is located right here. So we're right on the corner of it at the very highest amount, but we're still in the district and we're able to use irrigation water. Uh, next slide. So this is uh, the amount of water that was invested versus the amount of water pulled out of the ground in our Edison water district. Next slide. And this is how much water has been put into the ground every year. So this is an acre feet. Every year um, we put in a large quantity of acre feet. If you go to the next slide, you can see this is how high our water table is versus how low it would be if we would were not doing this. And we're, yep, question? So how are you putting water back in? Percolation or uh, drifting? Or? What it is is they have uh, seepage ponds. They have large areas that can be up to about 300 acres that is flat areas of land where they put in giant reservoirs that are very shallow. And then when they put the, the reservoirs in, when we have a large amount of water, like we'll have a flood, They'll take all that water, put it into those reservoirs, and then 80% of it can be taken out afterwards. And it's, it's a way to store water during a wet year for a dry year. Because otherwise, my, my district is one of the best off in, in the Southern Valley. We, we are having water restrictions, but our restrictions are nothing compared to the east side of the valley where they do not use water banking. So I'm, I'm using this, I just have this little mini presentation side of my bigger presentation to tell everyone that this would be a method that you could recommend to your lo local water districts as a way to greatly increase the amount of water that they have available. And it's a way to deal with drought years when you have one year where you receive 10,000 times more than a drought year where you receive no water. You know, if you get two inches of rain and then you get 20 inches of rain, or you know, wh whatever the, the ratio is, it, it's a way that you can protect yourself. Next slide. So what is an acre foot? Every, I, that's what all these terms were made in, and that's the term that industry uses. But if you take an entire football field and you cover it with one foot of water, that is one acre foot. So on my family's farm, normally uh, we use three to four acre feet of water per acre per land. We have 300 acres. And we have gotten a huge drop in the amount of water we're able to use. We went from uh, three to four. Last year, where they dropped us to 1.9 acre feet, to this year, where they dropped us to 1.3 acre feet. And I have friends where they're at three acre inches. That means if you took this whole thing, you can make it three inches tall. So the, the amount of water that we, we were forced to not use is, is really, really big. So we've had to use some draconian measures in order to drastically lower the amount of water that we use. And you guys can use them too if you want to really lower how much water you're using on your own properties. Next slide. So these are cherries that are dying due to not having water. And um, it's also partially because they use micro, micro, micro sprinklers. Um, if you guys are growing stone fruits, just, just a little side note, um, it's not good to have micro sprinklers, especially if you're using something called girdling. Because if you girdle your trees, that's an open wound where water can hit one tree, go to another tree, and infect it, and you can spread some really crazy bacterial diseases around really fast. But I digress. This is you don't want you don't want to kill your trees. You, know, you want your trees to survive, and you know that, that's 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 what my family does for a living. We grow trees. Next what slide. Did you say no sprinkling for stone fruit? Oh, uh, I, I just I'm not a big fan of, of micro sprinklers. I prefer micro drip irrigation. Okay. Because I, I, I mean, there will be people that will disagree with me uh, on this on this issue, but I, with micro sprinklers, you get the trunks wet, and w whenever you get the trunks wet, that's an area where you can get diseases. And we n we, we don't use micro sprinklers because we, we we believe that it causes us to have less diseases. Um, another thing that we have that we're utilizing 
is this is a weather station. So we have a weather station installed on our property that allows us to measure something called chilling portions. We grow stone fruit in an area where originally there were no stone fruit. We were the first cherry growers inside of Kern County. Um, in 1998, they developed several new low-chill cherry varieties. We, um, two of the breeders contacted my father. They used my dad's land as a nursery and paid him in cherry trees. And that's how we started growing a new fruit to the area. And four years later, when we had our first pick, it was two weeks earlier than anywhere else in the, the Northern Hemisphere. And then all the large cherry packing houses came down, tried to buy land. My dad saw that Cahoga was being taken out. He, he got big pieces of land, subdivided into smaller pieces, got pieces of land for free, and that's how my father started his farm. So he started with nothing, and now we have 320 acres. And um, anyway, that was kind of a little side note. But uh, we're using these in here. This is a, a weather station, and it's able to measure in the ground every three inches how much water is available. And um, it's a really good tool, but it's probably not that useful for the homeowner. Uh, next slide. So for the homeowner, this is something that you guys can use, which will probably be the biggest single thing that you can do to lower your water use. This is called a aerometer. And what this device is, is you take it wherever you're irrigating, like around the edge of, a, of, of your, your drip or whatever irrigation system you're using, you install this into the ground and it's able to measure how much water you have in the ground. So for us, we don't water until it goes to 50. So saturated, saturated ground is, is between zero and 10, and fully dry is you know, all the way you know, 90 or above. It's, it's based on the amount of pull, because uh, this is, a, this is a, a columnar full of water, and then water is being pulled out of the bottom. So you can put these in across your property. It doesn't really work for pots as much. But you can, if, if you have stuff planted in the ground, you can install these into your land and um, put them in an area where you irrigate, and it will tell you when it is that the plants can need another irrigation. So if you go to the edge of it, you can make it so that you use a fourth as much water, where you're just doing it whatever the trees are comfortable with. So um, different trees have different numbers where they're comfortable. We, we use about 40 to 50, so if it's, if it's a 20, then they're still wet enough, they don't, they don't need any more water. So we wait until the very edge. And this has allowed us to, to, to still grow stuff with 1.3 acre feet. What is the name? Uh, Aerometer. I-R-R? I-R-R-I-M-E-T-E-R. I-R-R? I-M-E-T-E-R. Maybe it's pronounced Aerometer. I've always thought it's Aerometer. I think it's I-R-R-O. Maybe it's I-R-R-O. I guess I took a photo with it. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a really, really useful device, and, and I, part of my, my job last summer was installing these all over the farm. How, how close do you put those? Uh, we put it, it's about six inches, or, or right on the edge of the wet zone around a drip area. So when you have it... it each tree? No, 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 no. Oh. Like, <laughs> one for each area that you're irrigating. Like, one, you know, if, if, it's, if this is a set, like, and they're all watered together, you know, you don't, you, you don't need to buy like hundreds of these things. You can have like three or one. But if you have multiple soil types or they're noticeably different, like if you have this area is a sandy streak over here and this is like clay, then you'd want to have two because they don't, you know, you have to use more water. Yeah? Couldn't you also just use it in different locations? Like, like if you wanted to just like put it somewhere, get a reading, and then put it in somewhere <laughs> it, else? Or is that It's better difficult? to leave it in place. Okay. Yeah, it's better to leave it in place and not... It, when you move it around, you can mess it up, and it's stuff that can break. So it's, it's good to just have you know one oh, question. You've had those in the in the soil for a year. Yeah. How much servicing have you had to do? Because that's why just I'm just refill it with water. That's all you have to do. Just make sure it's full of water. You tap it every once in a while to form some bubbles. Sometimes they, they, the older ones break, but the newer ones they last a lot longer. But it, it's been pretty easy to use. Question. Where's the best place to get less? That's just from that's just from my own experience. Yeah, it just whatever you know. A fifty is very very dry, dry and, and a twenty is not dry at all. That's really wet. So you think of something that's needs a lot more water. It's gonna you're not gonna want to, but you're not gonna want to stress it out that much. Okay. 
On a slope, would you recommend one on the top and one on the bottom, or could sure. you get away with one? Uh, if it's on a, if it's an extreme slope, you can have very big difference in water pressure from the top to the bottom of your property. So you might be perfectly fine on the bottom, and the top would be really dry, and you wouldn't know otherwise. Because we, we, I, I, I put. Usually I put about four of them on properties where there's whole blocks or one per an irrigation <laughs> set area. So the one on the top of the hill are usually going to be, they're going to they're going to have more issues because it's hard to get the pressure. Question? Are you playing around with the evapotranspiration replacement? Um, well, the, there, there's, are, are you talking about like products that make it so the trees don't, that the that they don't uh, produce no. vapor? No, more like uh, how much water is lost replacing that portion? Oh, well, you know, we in the newspaper, they, every day they, they have like a thing that says how much evapotranspiration, uh, you know, is, is happening. So you have to account for that in your irrigation. So if, for example, it's, it's really, really dry outside and, and it's very, very low humidity, then you're going to increase your, your water, you know, for, for that amount. We don't let the soil go dry. Totally, totally dry we, 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 we go to the edge of what the plants are comfortable with. And that, that way, we, we can keep it so that we're using the minimum amount of water that we need without uh, hurting the trees. But I mean, I, I, I'm. They have systems, though, that will automatically tie into your automatic uh, watering system. Yeah, we, we, we don't have automatic watering them. systems. Based, as, on, the based on how hot water. it is out. Yeah. Okay. Because it's, it, uh, you're, you're staying in uh, a region that's uh, more consistent. Okay. So it tends to use less uh, water than when the moisture level is dropped. Is it measuring the, the uh, amount of moisture at a particular depth? Yes, each one, the, they have different lengths. So you'll have one that's like really short, you know, half as long and like really long. You know, I think it's like six inches, one foot, two foot, three feet. So it depends on which, what kind of Yeah, and, and certain things that are shallow rooted, you know, you're gonna wanna ir irrigate more frequently than something that's deep rooted where you wanna have a longer, you know, deep water irrigation. We, we encourage our roots to be Next slide. Okay, here's another system we do. Uh, when it gets really hot, we open cloths over it. And we also use this to lower the amount of, uh, of chilling. We can modify the amount of, we irrigate through a stone creek. We don't get enough chilling by about 10, uh, 10 to 20 um, chilling portions. So we even even if we have a, a really warm winter, we can make it so that our we can still grow stone fruit by using these in the wintertime, not for the summertime. These we open up in the wintertime. Next slide. It increases your chilling hours? It's a way to make it so that you don't get some tractions. Uh -huh. So it keeps your things from, from getting too hot. So and you're shading them. Yeah, and another thing is uh, in the wintertime, you paint your trees white, and it can make a difference of 15 degrees on uh, the, the temperature of your trees, because trees are normally dark. And when you paint them white, you can also lower uh, the, the temperatures of them and increase your chilling portion. So it's a way that. We, you can get away with growing stuff that you normally couldn't. So that's why how we're able to grow a lot of stone fruit. We have a lot of cultural products. Is there a particular type of paint? It would be um, just, I think, a latex paint. Latex paints. You know, nothing with mercury or anything, you know. But, you know, just some kind of a latex paint. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So here we also we paint our trees white. So we put a sunscreen on it. And we also cover our, in some places, we cover our drip tape underneath plastic that allows us to also lower our, our water take, especially in blueberries and little plants. Mm -hmm. This is a high density, high cherry plant. Uh, next slide. Then this is what some of the neighbors have been experimenting with, where they just cover the entire property with uh, white plastic that uh, it lowers the amount of uh, light that goes in, but it's supposed to help with um, quite a few diseases and um, makes the trees happier in summer and in winter. But in the, in the spring, you don't want it because you want to be early in our area. 
Next slide. So another thing that we're doing, which is a secret, but I'll say it right here, is we have overhead watering um, systems. So what we do is whenever we can modify the temperature based on our, um, our, our weather meter thing, the, the box, and it'll tell us, oh, you need to turn this on, and this gets automatically turned on, whatever it gets up to 55 degrees. And then we're able to increase uh, the amount of chilling that our trees can get by a significant amount. Uh, next slide. And this is what we're doing all about. It's all about the cherries. So we're growing uh, you know, cherries in an area where you can't grow cherries, and we, that's what our livelihood is. So your, your adjustments are for all uh, trying to remove or, or mitigate the chill portion reduction. It's, it, it's not that just that a, it, it's supposed to, so you have longer periods when it's below 55 and you get more hours and you get less subtractions. So it's getting more hours and then not taking away hours. So when you're on the edge area, you can make a very significant difference, especially in warmer winters. A lot of this is for warm winters, like this last one we had. And we had a very, very good bloom, but then during the middle of bloom, it got to 93 degrees and a lot of our flowers fell off. And we, we had a pretty big, uh, not a very good year this year, but these are some of the fruit we did have, which were beautiful. These are different varieties of cherries. We, we grow um, about 32 varieties. Next slide. So you can follow me on Facebook, Steve Marie's Red Fruit. I'm gonna say that a couple times. These are some other fruits that I grow on my farm. Um, different times of the year. This is in fall, late summer, early summer. They're all just different, you know, rare fruits. Um, I like rare fruits. I'm gonna say that a lot. Next slide. Pomegranates, this is one of the varieties of fruits that you can grow that's a very drought tolerant fruit. And um, <coughs> this is a variety called early foothill. And um, yeah, they're, they're early, foothill? early foothill, yeah. Foothill. Uh, early, there's foothill and early foothill, and this is the early foothill. So it's, it's about, uh, about two weeks earlier than wonderful. Next slide. Jujubes, these guys are awesome. I love these jujubes and they require very, very little water. In China, they grow in some of the driest regions of China. Next slide. Figs. Uh, we have someone who's gonna talk about figs, so I don't really need to talk about them very much. Uh, but we grow, we, 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 we sell figs in Santa Monica Farmer's Market. Our figs are considered the very best flavored figs in Santa Monica. And um, Chinese are wu And uh, they're very tasty. Next slide. I grow citrus as well. We grow about 58 varieties of citrus. Citrus are great. I picked all these. Put them on my table. They're pretty. Next slide. So now I'm going to start talking about some rare fruits that are uh, drought tolerant. Uh, this one is a gruia. The, the gruia genus has about 200 species. This is an African gruia. Right here, uh, this is something called um, a diospersus lotus or the lotus persimmon. They, my tree has huge, huge yields, huge, huge yields on it. And the fruit to me tastes just like dates. I, I really like them. I think they could be used in home gardens, especially in low water situations. Next slide. What was right. it called again? Uh, which one? The last one. Uh, no, Diospersus no. lotus. Diospersus, that's the, 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 the persimmon genus. Um, D-I-O-S-P-Y-R-O-S. And then lotus, L-O-T-U-S. Then in here, these are two fruits that are grown on our, my family's farm. This is the Murray berry, which uh, is a variety of raspberry that was growing on my family's farm in Riverside since the 1920s. It was planted by my, my great grandfather, and we called them red berries, that's what he called them. And now we call them Murray berries, and we sell them exclusively at Santa Monica Farmer's Market. David Carp did an entire uh, genetic review on it, and it turns out that the, the ancestry of this, um, this berry is a cross between the Japanese wineberry and the Australian native raspberry, but it is an extremely heat tolerant raspberry thing, like, like thing. And then over here are the white chuck tooth mulberries. Next slide. I like mulberries. They can also be grown with very little water. These are two cultivars that I'm growing. This one over here is uh, one of the Morris ma uh, Macrocarpa uh, varieties. And then over here is uh, one of the giant white chuck toots. I sell them in Santa Monica. So when I have fruit, um, in order to fund my my interest and everything else, I, I have to, you have to make money on it or else you're gonna go broke. So I sell fruits in Santa Monica and I sell fruits for a living. What's the name of the green one? Uh, white Chatout, uh, S-H-A-T-O-O-T. When you plant your plant, how often do you have to water it? Um, you need to water we, we water well three days a week it. on 12 hour sets. Once a week? Three times a week for 12 hours. Oh, 
That's a, that's a, our, our irrigation schedule. For, for all crops, for all plants. For usually, unless they, that's, that's what it is they're supposed to get at least for everything, to, you know, unless they, they've got too much water. But that's what we've been at due to the, the drought. Question? Do you find that a lower gallon per hour drip for longer is more effective than a higher gallon per hour drip for less time? Um, we have both, um, but as long as all of them are the same kind, because one thing is we'll have one area have have a what if that, I mean we'll we'll have different parts of the farm having different quantities of water being released, and if it's the same block, it'll cause problems. This area will get really wet. This area won't. So as long as everything is homogenous, that's that's the best. Okay. Uh, next slide. So here's your soil type. Uh, it's sandy loams in general. Sandy loam is what almost all our property. You can drive on when it's wet. Uh, I'm interested in this is. Um, one of the Derivia um, uh, Hebelia ex capra, and then this is this is a chi apple that's immature. This is called tropical apricot. These are two uh, varieties that they don't need very much water. Uh, this one's from Africa. And this is a cross between an African and a Sri Lankan species. And these are pineapples that I grew in my greenhouse. And if you grow pineapples in a pot, they're they're very easy and they they're bromeliad. And I I don't really water them very much at all. They they still give me pineapples. Here's some cactus. I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about cactus because people have heard about cactus, but here's a, this is one in, in my front yard that fruits, produces these fruits that once they're open and dry, they taste pretty good. Here's a tuna, and here's the myrtle cerus, which was you know, talked about in the last presentation. <coughs> Next slide. Here's some more cactus things, dragon fruits, and this is called Barbados gooseberry. It's a leaf um, variety of Forestia, uh, which is the, a very primitive uh, genus of, uh, of cacti, and I really like to eat them. They're kind of like a soury, cool thing. I think they could be utilized. Next slide. Watermelon. Watermelon are from the deserts of South Africa and across Africa, and uh, we grow watermelon some in farmers markets, and uh, they, they can be grown out in very very hot areas in the sun all their life. And people, I think, grow watermelons in their backyard. Next slide. All right. Here's. Um, this one is an Australian native called midgen berries. Um, Ostromertis uh, is the name of the genus. Um, these ones, uh, I've got them in my yard and they're, they're in a pretty dry spot. They're, this is one of the bush tucka species. There's lots and lots of species native at uh, Australia called bush tucka. Over here is a natal plum. Next slide. Here's some stuff that are native to America. So um, this is called a, um, this is the, the Catalina Island cherry. I, this is one of the, the best tasting native fruits to California that nobody's ever heard of, but they're, I, I find them really tasty. I think if someone did a little bit of selection, you can make some really good fruit out of it. This is uh, one of the sumac from the roost genus, and uh, or called lemonade berry, and then this is one of the Washingtonians that was very, very prolific, and the fruit were pretty good. Next slide. the middle one, uh, That was, um, it was called the Catalina Island cherry, <coughs> or holly leaf cherry. Uh, it's called uh, Prunus, P-R-U-N-U-S, L-Y-O-N-I-I -I is the name of the genus and species, if you want to know it. Uh, next slide. Now these are Sambucus or elderberries, and I commercially grow elderberries and sell them in Santa Monica for flowers and for fruit. And this is a California native that nobody's really grown at all, but I grow them and sell them. <laughs> and I went to a talk about them. Question? There's two forms of at maturity, one's green and one's purple. Which one are you focused on? The purple one? Um, that looks like a purple. Th this is uh, the what's called the Mexican elderberry. Yeah, cerulean. Yeah, and um, on, on ours sometimes they'll have the the really thick um, yeast co covering, and sometimes they'll be black. The wax cover. Yeah, yeah. So it just it, it the, the same ones could either be black or or white on the same plant, or even in the same bunch. Really? Yeah. So. And mine's an indeterminate variety, so I, I get fruit. I have fruit started in, uh, at the end of March, and I'm going to have fruit all the way to September. Because it's an indeterminate variety. Are you making clonal selections from seedlings, or just? Um, this one, I collected it in the mountains, and I, I thought it was a pretty good plant, and it produces really big umbils. So I'm, I'm happy with, with him. And I, it was my, my own find in the mountains. Question? So I've, I've um, foraged those, and I've noticed that sometimes they're really sweet, and sometimes they're kind of bitter. Uh, have you have you 
done selection on yours for that? Or? What it is is any kind of the wild species will have lots of genetic diversity, and whenever you eat one, you never know if you're eating the very worst or the very best. <laughs> so I always eat more and more and more, and then I'm like, okay, this, this is really it's very a good. sacrifice. <laughs> but yeah, I've, I've eaten lots and lots of terrible stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So elderberry tasting is not the funnest tasting. <laughs> Next slide. So here's some more North American natives. This is Jerusalem artichoke, which is actually native to the Great Plains. This is a, a U.S. native species that can be utilized as a tuber. The only thing is it gives you really bad gas. <laughs> if anyone has any experience with it. And then this has been mentioned multiple times today, which is the first time I've ever even heard it mentioned. Well, I, I thought it was going to be novel, but I guess everyone's heard of it already. But this is a, the, one of the native uh, goji berries. Because there's uh, lots and lots of Goji berries. What? Uh, goji berries. Goji. Yeah, uh, lysine. I think lysine is good. Yeah, lysine. Yep. Next slide. So now I'm going to talk about some wild fruits from the mountains that I think people can grow or should be utilized at least. Um, these are all fruits that I collected two weeks ago. Um, in here you'll see this is the golden currant. This is one of the Mahonia species. These are wild uh, black currants, wild raspberries, thimbleberries, <coughs> etc. Next slide. So, as I mentioned earlier, one of my favorite fruits to eat in the entire world is this one right here. It's called a Saskatoon from the Amel cherry of Eunice. And these are berries. These ones just grow wild in Idaho, and I just love to eat them. What's so what they call them? Uh, Saskatoons or Juneberries is a common name. Or uh, Amel cherry. So it's, uh, I think A M. E L A N C I E R. You got it. <laughs> question? Oh, question? question? How do you know they're not poisonous when you're wondering around? Around. Yeah, because I know them a lot. I've been eating these since I was a, like a baby. But if, you know, as a baby, how did you know? I <laughs> spend weeks on end going into the mountains with a pocket knife and a water purifier. And I read all the edible fruit plants when I was a little child. So for most of, I mean, there's, there's I've tried to read all the wild plant books from every region of the world, if, if I can find them, you know. And um, I, it's, once you know families, there's families that are safe and there's families that are dangerous. So like we talk about ribes, which is the gooseberry genus. To my knowledge, there's no poisonous gooseberries. So if I see a gooseberry, I'm like, I know I can eat that. If you talk about, you know, he was talking about milkweeds, most of them are poisonous. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mess with those. Those are, ooh, I'm, that's a milkweed species. I'm not, I'm not gonna try that. If it's something from, you know, um, the mint family, I'll smell it, but I'm not gonna eat it. There's not really many edible mints. But, any, but anyway, the, when it, and identifying wild plants, it, it is risky, especially for things like from the honeysuckle family, because a lot of those are poisonous. But I've heard some are edible, but like I, I ate some um, a honeysuckle, a twinberry, when I was in China in Xinjiang, and after I ate it, my, my goals swelled up and I was poisoned. So, <laughs> but you know, sometimes you poison yourself. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever you're honey, honey for rare fruits, and then you know other stuff. But next slide. So now I'm going to talk about going to Asia. I was in Asia for nine months looking for rare exotic fruits. Next slide. So I I, I just went to Napex and I uh, next slide. I was elected one of their, uh, well, I, I was a keynote speaker, well, the, the banquet speaker in Napex, and then I was elected to the board, and I'm really excited, and I love fruits, fruits are cool. And um, over here, this is, uh, everything that's blue is where I traveled in the last nine months. Um, and this is my map of Asia, where I've been. So when I went here, I visited rare fruit collectors up the whole coast, went through several regions of China, Xinjiang has some really cool temperate fruits, and all over the place, next slide. So now I'm gonna talk about Africa. This is uh, near um, Dar es Salaam, about 200 kilometers north. Next slide. This is a really cool drought tolerant fruit called uh, the baobab. Um, and they're really, really nice trees. The leaves are edible, the pods are edible. Uh, what it is is you, you eat them fresh, they taste kind of like dried yogurt, kind of. And if you boil it, they, they can turn it into like a, a porridge that tastes like oatmeal. But for, for people when you don't have anything to eat, they're pretty useful. But there's there should be some varieties that have been selected, but there's been no selection for improved varieties. And this is one of the only things that you see that's native to Africa that people are eating from Africa. Next slide. So this is more products made out of baobab. These are fresh pods hanging on a tree. And then this is uh, baobab candy. 
it tastes pretty good. Everyone was really uh, into it. Next slide. So when I was in mainland Africa, the thing that, that surprised me the most is that nobody even knows what is edible in the wild. So the only fruit you'll even see are on the side of the road, you'll see people with peeled oranges. And even though they have so many native, you know, um, different like the wild medlars, the, the monkey oranges, the marulas, etc., no one's eating them. People are trying to eat oranges and apples. So that's, that's just a shame to me. Next slide. So when I went to the island of Zanzibar, they do have a lot more fruit, including apples from uh, Washington State. <laughs> um, but if you look, where are these fruit from? Most of these are from the, either the New World or from um, you know, Southeast Asia. Next slide. Um, this was a, a fruit, uh, I, I went to, when I was in China, they had a, um, a cultural fair and um, they brought out, there was a group from Sudan and they brought these fruits out. And if anyone, this one I'm positive is a gruya at the end, but I have no idea what this fruit is. Someone told me it was a gingerbread plum, and that's so what I thought, and then it's not a gingerbread plum. <laughs> does, any, does anyone know what this is? I'm kind of curious. I haven't had anyone been able to identify it. Which one? Uh, these two right here. It looks like a date in the middle. Is it a date? Palm? No, not it's, a it's not a palm tree. It's some kind of a vine. A vine. Yeah, <laughs> planted some seeds. <laughs> I thought it was ginger. I, I, I thought it was an Ericaceae, you know, gingerbread palm, but it was not. Some kind of weird viney thing. It tastes like blackberry jam. No. Okay. It has a big seed in the middle. Um, it, it's it's not the the blackberry jam, which is. Randia. Yeah, it's not a randia species, um, but it, it's got like a kind of gummy date like on the outside with the seed and you suck on it and stuff. I don't know. Alright. Just asking. This was a, another species native to Africa that is endangered and was the only thing native that, to that part of Africa that people were eating apart from the baobab. These are the babongo fruits from uh, the Saba genus, which is related to Wilichias, or which are considered like one of the best tasting fruits in the world. And uh, I was able to find two different species of Saba in, um, on the island of Zanzibar. Uh, and this one is called Vitoria, which is an endangered species. So that's kind of cool. Next slide. So now I'm going to China. This is me and my brother. And that's my university. And it's got a pagoda. It's pretty. Next slide. So here's some product from China. Um, these are all different fruits that are you know, eaten there. Like this is the red-hearted kiwis, which taste delicious. They're like honey. They make the green kiwis taste terrible. I, mean, I never want to eat green kiwi again after eating that ruined it for me. This is one of the fissilis or um, hush cherries. These ones taste like little mangoes or, or vanilla mangoes. Over Are here. Are they crown cherries? Huh? Are those the crown cherries? It has a lot of common names Cape gooseberries, brown cherries, yeah. poha, etc. So, fissilis is the genus, and I'll, I'll call them fissilis. Mm -hmm. Or they call them um, winyar. Winyar. Um, and then over here, these are some of the, um, the hot corn apples. And, um, next slide. Did you bring back some seed in any of these? Uh, I have a small amount of seed import permit, and I have brought back some seeds of some different things. So are you going to try growing some? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, over here, uh, this is um, jujubes. People love jujubes in China. These are goji berries. They're all over the place. Next slide. Uh, this is the Yangtze River Gorge and the dam on it. Um, beautiful place. Next slide. So these are wild fruits of China that are not being utilized. In China, there's tons and tons of rubus species, but none of them have been selected. So, you know, we have blackberries and we eat blackberries, and that's part of our culture to eat blackberries. But if you go to Asia, they grow everywhere, but nobody eats them. They think they're poisonous or something, but there's not a single poisonous rubus species. They just, they're not utilized. So this is a rubus species that grows like grapes. No, nobody even, no selection, no use. It's, oh, that's for birds. Know. Go over here, this is some wild tea. This was grown in the mountains of uh, Zhejiang province. Uh, this is a gourd species, that's a wild gourd that's edible. Hint, hint. Two guesses, what's this? Logan. Logan, wrong. Dyes flowers? Huh? Dyes flowers? Nope, um, it, this is actually a, uh, a sap, sapin, sapine, or the sopinda. Oh, sapinda. Yeah, sapinda, yeah. So. The, is that the area or? Uh, th this one was one of, this is the, the Chinese soap nut. Uh, 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 Sepinda, I think, Akatentis, Akatentelis, I think. Um, and this was growing in a cooler part of China, but I think you could cross this with Longan Relichis to get like better fruit. 
because it, you know, they're related to each other and they look identical and I bit into one and it was terrible. <laughs> terrible. That was, I'm sure that was poisonous. <laughs> Just my whole mouth. Uh, for like an hour. It was horrible. Um, among the worst tasting things I've ever eaten in my life. And then, but, but, it, but you wash your clothes with it. It's got use. It's ut utility. Um, then over here are trappa or devil's nut and these are aquatic plants that they used to be really popular in the dark ages in Europe and then they went away and no one even knows about them anymore. But they're really tasty and they taste like chestnuts. Excellent. This is one of the things I've been researching extensively across the US, across the world. <laughs> this is maclura or um, chia fruit or watermelon berry and I've been looking for improved varieties. These are varieties of chia fruit I found while traveling across different regions of China and looking for them. So, um, and then, oh, go back one. So these are all different kinds of chia. I can, oh, I can stay on this side. I didn't know that. OK. Um, <laughs> so this is a, a chia a alcohol that tastes like plum wine. You look over here. This is a giant chia that we're about this big. In the United States, we have no improved varieties of them. In Chinese, they're called zhi guo, but nobody's ever even heard the word, um, even though they're native there. So you'll go to a place, and you'll, you'll ask people, oh, have you ever heard of this? And it, everyone says no, and then you go, like I, I went on a, on a, a three-day trek to this little island that was called um, Jiming, uh, Jiming Da, and I, I went onto a fishing boat to get there, and I went there just to find these fruits on that island. And I went back, and everyone was like, I have no idea what that is. But I, I think they taste good. Next slide. Can you skip that one, please? Oh. That's perfect. Oh, sure. Okay, so this is the one that I am growing in my yard. Uh, I got this in 2004 at the Festival of Fruits at Cal Poly Pomona. I have no idea what variety it is because I bought it. It was called Female. <laughs> I don't know who sold it to me. But it's a really good one and a really big one. And I've been propagating them and I'm trying to get all the different chia fruit germplasm across the United States. So if anyone has chia fruit and they have germplasm, <laughs> I want some. Do you like chia to eat? I do. I do like chia. I have a chia. What's that called? <laughs> oh, oh, it's it's chia fruit. A C H E space F R U I P. And um, what's the plant? It's in the Chinese. Moraceae family. What uh, does it mean uh, It's uh, it's the the mu radical with the stone radical. So it's it's like shito to sh uh, shito and mu uh, mu okay. shi. Sure. Yeah, you need male and female. And then just two days ago, I was looking at my collection, and one of my che started to be variegated. So this is a variegated che, and I think that's the first one. I I, I talked to my friends in China that are che collectors, and they've never seen a variegated one. So I think it, I'm going to make my own variegated che varieties. <laughs> Next slide. So mushrooms. I'm not supposed to talk about mushrooms. They're not drought tolerant, but I like mushrooms. So I, I just included these slides. Next slide. More mushrooms. I love mushrooms. They're so cool. <laughs> I want to start growing mushrooms, but they need water. Okay. Next slide. So here's some nuts. This is a nut from the Torreya genus. Does everybody know what Torreya is? The California Torreya. It's a, it's a member of the Taxiaceae family, which is related to the ewes. Oh, why? E W U, not like a like a cheap U. <laughs> and this nut here, these cost 400 RMB a kilo, or about 70 dollars a pound. Oh. And no one's ever even heard of them in America. We don't even know what they are. But people could people should grow those, <laughs> sell them to China, or even grow them locally. I mean, that kind of price it's, it makes it worthwhile, doesn't it? Anyway, and chestnuts. Chestnuts are everywhere. They love chestnuts. I, w I stopped in one little village on the Yangtze River. And they had these little chestnuts that were this big, that you could eat them raw. And that was pretty cool. And then this is a native uh, pariah species. Next slide. These are another really cool fruit. This is um, the Crategus genus, which uh, this is uh, the, the hawthorn apples. They don't really have a good English translation name, but they make them into candies every fall, and they're delicious when they're in candy form. Really high in pectin. They make them into fruit skins. Big fan of these. Next slide. Now these are some spring fruits from northeastern China. One of them is this one, which has been introduced to the US, I found out, called Tunia sinensis, T-O-O-N, 
I A space N I uh, N S I S, I believe. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Chinese yeah. too. It's called Shang uh, Tsun. Shang Tsun. And um, this is one of the only tree vegetables that exist. So it's a, it's, a, it's a tree that they grow in greenhouses. They have selected and pruned varieties that have larger buds that open up. This is my hand, by the way. My hand is the, the hand model on everything. So they're about <laughs> like, it's a big, it's almost like a head of broccoli, only it's a sprout that tastes kind of like onion, onions. And I'm a really big fan. And I think they can be grown in very, very cool climates as an added crop. And they have a lot of utility. Over here, this is the Chinese cherry, which is some other species of prunus. I have no idea what species of prunus it was. They just called it Zhonghua Yingga, which is, you know, it's China cherry. We can quite, quite see it. Oh, sorry? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. And then over there, stone pine. Um, and then these were a variety of mulberry that ripened at, um, this was December. So that's pretty cool. Next slide. Oh, uh, that's something called a, they call it corn melon or jiao, uh, jiao guo, like, like corn melon. I, I've never, I, I was just, I saw it and I took a photo of it. Some weird cucumber that I, I don't really know what it is. Kind of like a slightly sweet cucumber thingy. But it just was different. Like, you know, that's, I didn't know what it was. I, I still, I'm still not sure on the, on the, the scientific <coughs> name of it. But yeah. Next slide. This is Yang Mei, or mm. people are calling it Yummy Berry. Yeah. Uh, it's Myrica rubra. I was part of a group that was based in San Diego that brought in quite a few trees. I imported 300 trees in the United States, of which 15 are alive. <coughs> so, uh, one out of 20 survived. And um, what it is is this is a good fruit and that's a bad fruit, and the difference is the humidity level. So in order for um, for the fruits to be good, they're, they're supposed to have high humidity. But it's a single seed in the center. And those are little globules that are coming out of it that in order to swell correctly, it must have high humidity. But the trees die so easily. But in China, they grow these on just rock cliffs where this is a nitrogen fixing plant. And you'll just find them on hillsides and areas where you can't grow other things. So if they figure out how to grow it here, supposedly, in China at least, it's grown in areas where you know it's not protected, rocky you know, hillsides. But in America, it has to be super, super cared for, humidity control, <laughs> and everything else. But in China, it's a, it's a, it's a hardy, drought-tolerant mountain plant. But in America, it's you know the hardest thing to grow ever. You have to put in a greenhouse and you make it misters and all kinds of stupid stuff. But I'm very interested in this. Huh? Are your trees? Are your trees? Are your trees this pretty? Um, they flowered. The fruit didn't set. I'm not. I don't want it to set yet. Next year, I'll probably have some. I hope. Very sour. It depends on the variety. Uh, the Dongkui variety is sweeter, as are the Bichi, but some of the other cultivars are, 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 are pretty sour. A lot of them are sweet and sour at the same time. So they'll have a high bricks, but then a high acidity, but some of them are very, very acidic. But there's, there's, there's quite a few cultivars, and there's about 760,000 acres in China. Next slide. That's me in, um, the, in Xinjiang in a yurt. People live in them, and they move them around all the time. Next slide. These are fruits of Xinjiang. This is a fruit I'm very interested in. It's of the Nitrilacea family. Really, really a cool uh, family of plants. Sorry, I need to block your view. Um, these grow in salt flats and on sand dunes. And they can take extremely salty areas and they can survive to negative 40 degrees to positive 40 degrees Celsius, which would be about 120. So they're, they're a desert plant that produces lots and lots of berries. And there's a currently a program to domesticate them. And I find them very, very interesting. Say the name again? Uh, it's Nitrilia, uh, N-I-T-R-I-L-L-I-A, um, I believe. And then these are, um, the these, these berries on that side are something called the um, sea berries, yeah, or sea buckthorn. What's the plant family? Uh, which one? This one is Nitrilalacea. So it's N-I-T, yeah. N-I-T, N I T R I L L I E A E. <coughs> yeah. And then this is a barbarous species, a barberry, and that's a vaccinium. Next slide. So these are more pictures of, uh, these are improved cultivars of sea berries. Next slide. So now I'm leaving China and I'm going to talk about other parts of the world. Let's go. All right. This is Myanmar. Beautiful place. Next slide. So these are Malaysia. They have lots and lots of different kinds of um, root, uh, 
of different kinds of um, gingers that they grow there. And I love artocarpus. That's a chepadec, uh, breadfruit, mangoes, continue. Next slide. Thank you. This is Thailand. This was a nut that I found in northern Thailand. It tastes like a cross between a almond and a pumpkin seed. And they were really good. Nobody knows them. I've never seen them apart from in northern Thailand. And I think they could have, you know, commercially be grown on a large scale. Uh, then this is one of the Salak species over here. The, the Thai Salak is nothing near as good as the Bali varieties, but they're all right. Uh, durian, people like durian. Thai Salak, good stuff. Next slide. Okay, now he's in Laos. This is one of the Elecnia species. So Elecnia includes gomi, autumn olives, etc. This was a really big one with fruits that were about that big. I've heard different people, people are saying it might be latifolia, but I'm not really sure on that. Um, then that's one of the Zizipius maritinius, or the Indian jujube. These are dry mountain fruits and stuff. This is the one of the most drought tolerant of all tropical fruits we can grow here. It's called uh, wamuchu. It's kind of like our vanilla tamarind. They grow across the world. They were introduced, and now they're just pest plants everywhere. Do you grow the Indian jujube yourself? Yes, I do. Um, then this is uh, one of the. These are they call these Indian gooseberries. It's not a gooseberry, but from it's a philosandrin phil genus. Philolanthus. Phil yeah. Philolanthus. Yeah. How's the guam so There's a Muntingia uh, calabra over there, which you just see them on the sides of the streets everywhere, and they, they, they require no care. And I think that these ones could be cultivated. And, huh? They come from the, from the Americas. Which one? These are native to the Americas, yes, as are these. Yes. But you see them wild all across Asia. So even though both of these species are native to the Americas, they were introduced to Asia a very long time ago as a food crop, then escaped into the wild, and are now considered just a street nibble. But both of these are from America. Yeah, as is uh, the, the, the mini green um, cucumbers, not cucumbers, the eggplants. You ever see those little eggplants they eat in Thai restaurants? That's actually a weed species that came from South Carolina, was introduced to Asia, and became a culinary staple which is still in America considered poisonous and grows in the wild. Interesting, the wild plant of America is a cultivated thing in Thailand. Next slide. It's not poisonous, so we're, we're mistaken. <laughs> so this is Myanmar, this is giant bale fruit. This is water crops, they have too much water, we don't have enough. So they grow crops in water that's like up to your waist. and. Um, we, we could not grow this, these kinds of crops because we don't have water. Um, but in the north of Thailand, it's really dry. And these are, uh, those are plums that were ripe in, uh, in mid-February. And you know, bale fruit, this is a giant bale fruit. We don't have any of the improved cultivars of bale fruit in America. Our bale fruit are terrible. And we can't get them because they spread uh, Huang Long Bing or Pearson disease because it's in the citrus family. Next slide. From there, I went to Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka's got lots of cool fruits, like Sri Lankan olives. This is one of the, uh, Ster like Kulpia species, which is a, a genus of nuts. Uh, over here, this is the inside of a bale fruit. That's the inside of a wood apple, which are both re relatives to citrus. And you crack these open, and this tastes like marmalade, like orange marmalade, and you can put it on toast. I, that's how I was eating it. I just would get toast and cover it with bale fruit, jam, it was natural. No additives, raw, healthy food people. Yeah. And then this is uh, the wood apple, which people make into shakes and stuff. And this is what a wood apple looks on the outside. They look kind of like a, kind of like a, uh, that's what they look like. Yeah, <laughs> distinct, that's what they look like. Okay, and this is a market, next slide. And then this was in the United Arab Emirates. So went there, that's Dubai. This is uh, some kind of a, another kind of a jujube relative they call bear, which is eaten by the Indian workers there. And then up here, these are um, one of the Bowia species which is imported there and sold. Um, and they're like little mango things. Next slide, it tastes like little mango. Uh, but then you go in and they sell lots and lots of, you divide this by three for the exchange rate, by the way, so if you wanna, it's like $2 for a whole big thing of just really black pomegranates. And then tons and tons and tons of kinds of dates. It's like 80 different varieties of dates in like one market, like, ah, oh, that's too many dates, <laughs> love dates. A lot of sugar though, careful. Next slide, so from there I went to India. And um, I visited a lot of rare fruit collecting friends there. Went to an Indian wedding. Uh, 
jackfruit just everywhere. And this one here is, anyone know what this is? No, that is a toddy palm. So what, it, what happened in this instance is I went into the store, I said, oh, there's toddy palm. I should get the biggest one because that's probably, you know, it's got the most meat. But what I didn't know is that you collect toddy when it's small because it's still soft and, and before it hardens. So this toddy, I got the biggest one in it, which was this one. I went to the, to the, to the, to the store, to, to my hotel, and said, can you open this for me? He, he brings out a machete to try to <laughs> cut it, but he didn't realize how hard it was, and he hit it, and it bounced off, and it cut off the tip of his finger. Oh. <laughs> so, and then I, I didn't see that guy again. <laughs> I, you know, but that, that did happen. How did the finger taste? Huh? What? How did the finger taste? I didn't try the finger. I, I, but I, you know, it was just that. I, it was my mistake in thinking that oh, you're supposed to get the biggest one. But that was it was too woody because it, when it's really hard, you, you can't you can't cut it or anything. You, you get it when they're little, because then it's soft. But then when they're too big, it gets too hard inside. So this that's my experience with toddy palm. And they make it in alcohol and other stuff. But it's an interesting fruiting palm that can grow in very very dry tropical to subtropical areas. Uh, T O D D Y. Toddy palm. Everyone likes toddy. Okay? And then this is one of the Garcinians, just like random Garcinians all over the place. Uh, and this is nutmeg. And then this is jackfruit going to market. Next slide. So I like artocarpus. Anybody else like artocarpus? Yay! Yeah. Oh, yeah. hey, aren't they cool? Uh, <laughs> this one's the, what's called wild jack. These grow all over the forest. They, they kind of open like meringue, where you just open it up and then the whole thing comes out, you can eat it. And each fruit tastes different. Like, there's no set flavor to me. Every time I ate a different fruit, it had a completely different flavor profile. And that's probably because it's just wild. And over here, this is La Cucha, uh, Monkey Jack. Next slide. Okay, um, over here was the Yaksa, which was uh, one of the wild fruits. Um, uh, this is the, the Kalum, Kalum, right? Oh, Kokum. Kokum, Kokum, yeah. This is sweet Kokum, which tastes like like a uh, mango sting, really, really sweet kokum that was collected from wild specimens by my friend here that, that I visited his home in Karnataka. Next slide. Then I went from there to another uh, place in Karnataka and I was able to stay in a four star um, eco resort for a whole uh, week where they gave me my own cook and I stayed in the honeymoon suite as long as I spent seven hours a day going into the jungle finding rare fruit. Break, break time. <laughs> So these are some of the fruits that I found while going through the jungles and stuff. I sweat a lot. Like this was the beginning of the day. At the end, like all my shirt all the way down, just sweat. But it was wonderful. It was so cool. One of the things I found was this one, which is called Salakia chinensis. It took me a long time to identify that fruit. And they taste like little mini mango stings. Really big fan of that one. Over here, this was a giant nutmeg species, whereas a nutmeg that had fruit that were about that big. Uh, down here, this is a rattan palm relative. Let's go to the next slide. And then over here, these are other fruits I found in the jungle. This was another Elegnia species in the jungle. I, I freaked out when I found that because I know all Elegnias are, are edible. I'd never seen this one before. So this one might not have a scientific name. I don't know. Huh? A lingaro. Oh. Yeah. Oh no, no, that's not that's not lingaro. Uh, lingaro is the much smaller. Lingaros are about that big. I have lingaro in my personal collection. These ones were about that big. And they're, the whole thing is covered in scale, like in a, in a white, uh, cracking thing. Which country are you in? Here? This is in southern India in the state of Karnataka, uh, about, about three hours south of Goa. And these are fruits. This was one of the ones I liked the most of all of them. This is called Zizipheus uh, rugosa. And this one right here is a vining jujube relative that grows like a blackberry that has fruits that are about this big and white, and you eat them and they melt in your mouth when you eat them. I'm a big, big fan of this one. And I thought these were really good, and I've never seen them or heard of them anywhere. But the people there eat them. Then right here, this is a sweet lovey lovey. Most of the lovey loveys, as you guys know, are not sweet. This was a sweet one. So this is in the same family. It's called, it used to be called uh, F L U A C R A C A, and now they moved it to Salicacea to the Willow family. But these ones, you eat them, they taste like a, like a cranberry, but sweet. They're really, really nice. Then over here, this is uh, a saponaceous fruit, which is called a cat eye. 
which is a lot like a lychee, only it grows on a, on a little bush that's this tall. I've never seen a, a small bush lychee relative. And this is another, uh, this is glycis, uh, G-L-Y-C-I-A-S, which is um, related to citrus. Um, and I, I actually ha bought that previously in America, and then I saw in India different varieties of it in the wild. Next slide. Oh, one more back. Go back. This thing's awesome. This is the best um, Syzygium, not sure which kind, but really, really good. Might be Syzygium aquum, maybe, uh, which is one of the, the wax apples. These ones were super, super sweet, delicious, succulent. Like, people would fight over these kinds of things. But a lot of the Syzygiums we have in America are terrible. But most of the wax apples, at least from personal experience, are subpar, stringent, not fun things to eat. Next slide. So then I went to Turkey. And in Turkey, these are uh, Turkish uh, carrots for sale, along with lots of dried fruits. This was in March, and they were selling a really, really large variety of mulberry that had fruit that were about that big. It tastes like a blackberry, really, really high quality. They said this is the first variety that can be grown on commercial scales. Next slide. Now this is me happy in Istanbul. Next slide. Okay, this is, um, what I did is I met a friend there and I assisted him in grafting trees around all of Western Turkey from Istanbul all the way to Anatolia along the whole coastline. And I traveled about, about 1,200 miles in nine days. And you know, this is a pepino dulce. Right here, this is a, a tree that's a walnut that's being grafted. This is how we grafted them. They're super hardwood. That's what we were grafting were walnuts because he help grab all that's over. Next slide. Um, these are figs being stored, and this is top working that we were doing on different trees. And each one of these is a different variety, because they were bringing in new American varieties we wanted. Uh, next slide. So these are olives. Next slide. And this is uh, different stuff in, in Germany. They have some of the most diversity of fruits in their markets, because they can bring fruits from everywhere. So I was really impressed with the German fruit markets. Next slide. Um, these are drought tolerant. Uh, this is cassia and dates, big, big, big date. Next slide. And thank you very much. We're follow me on Facebook. I have a page called Stephen Murray's Rare Fruit. And if you just look at that's my Facebook page, and I put hundreds and hundreds of photos on there. So everywhere I go, I'm, I'm looking for rare fruit and more things to do with rare fruit. It's all about rare fruit. So, thank you guys. Thank you.